right. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, everyone. That's a wonderful psalm, Psalm 59. And we're in the midst of a series <coughs> of messages based in the psalms called Soundtrack of Lent. That's based on the uh, devotional book Soundtrack, a 40-day playlist through the psalms written by J.D. Walt of Seedbed Publishing. We're working our way through 40 psalms uh, during Lent, each day taking another psalm. And uh, we're looking at it in our daily devotions from Seedbed Daily Text. Uh, you're welcome to join us at 9 o'clock on Facebook Live or read it yourself. You can get it at seedbed.com. Uh, look for the uh, uh, daily text uh, tab and pull that down. We're exploring how the Psalms help us to worship and how to pray. Someone has said, if you want to learn how to pray, read the Psalms because the Psalms will teach you how to pray. And the Psalms will help us to express our emotions, our feelings to God in a healthful and uh, faithful way. These uh, feelings can sometimes be raw and uncensored, can't they? And that's a good thing, because we need to be honest and open to God in prayer, sharing our deepest heart and bearing our souls before him. Last week, we started with Psalm 44, which was a lament after a military defeat, and it showed us how to deal with defeats, we deal with them by remembering God's faithfulness through his mighty acts of the past, and then by turning our sorrow into an act of prayer and praise of our God, who is always present and always active, even when we don't realize it. Today we take a look at Psalm or Song 59. Psalm 59 is what is called an imprecatory psalm. It pronounces a curse, which is what imprecation means, a spoken curse, and there are 10 such imprecatory psalms in our Bible, in the book of Psalms. Psalm 7, 35, 55, 58, this one, 59, and then 69, 79, 109, 137, and 139. There's a lot of nines in the imprecatory psalms. But there are 10 of them in the book of Psalms, and they all speak curses on either Israel's enemies or on the writers, usually King David's enemies. They are a plea for God to punish those enemies and condemn them to harm and or to death. These imprecatory psalms can cause a great deal of discomfort for many, especially since the Bible also tells us to forgive our enemies, to love them, and not to curse them. Paul writes in Romans 12, verse 14, Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. And then Jesus taught us in Matthew 5, verse 44, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So for good reason, some Christians have a hard time voicing the imprecatory psalms like Psalm 59. Nevertheless, every psalm is the word of God. And so we have to deal with them and we have to come to understand them from the perspective of God and from the saints of God. Our cancel culture would probably just delete them from the Bible, but we're not going to do that. We will not do that. Instead, we're going to understand them and apply them from our faith perspective. So let's take a look at this psalm from an accurate translation, the New Revised Standard Version. The first section of the psalm is verses 1 through 5, and it goes like this. Deliver me from my enemies, O my God. Protect me from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from those who work evil, from the bloodthirsty, save me. Even now they lie in wait for my life. The mighty stir up strife against me. For no transgression or sin of mine, O Lord, for no fault of mine, they run and make ready. Rouse yourself, come to my help and see. You, Lord God of hosts, are God of Israel. Awake to punish all the nations. Spare none of those who treacherously plot evil. Selah. There's that word again, Selah, or Selah. We'll see it again after verse 13 in this psalm. And uh, as we mentioned last week, it's hard to translate Selah. We assume it's a musical term since the psalms were meant to be sung. And so we presume it means something like pause or interlude or maybe even a tambourine solo. In any event, it's a break from one section to the other. The first section cries out to God for protection against an enemy. And this is a psalm written by David, and most scholars consider it was written at the time of David's conflict with King Saul, before David became king, after Saul. 
And most scholars think that David wrote it shortly after this episode retold in 1 Samuel 19, verses 10 through 12. Saul sought to pin David to the wall with the spear, but he eluded Saul so that he struck the spear into the wall. David fled and escaped that night. Saul sent messengers to David's house to keep watch over him, planning to kill him in the morning. David's wife, Michal, told him, If you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. So Michal called, let David down through the window. He fled away and escaped. So the enemy, if the scholars are correct, is King Saul himself. And David is crying out to God for protection because he's been hunted and pursued for no transgression or sin of mine, he writes. The second section is verses 6 through 13. It goes like this. Each evening they come back howling like dogs and prowling about the city. There they are bellowing with their mouths with sharp words on their lips for who they think will hear us. But you laugh at them, O Lord. You hold all the nations in derision. O my strength, I will watch for you. For you, O God, are my fortress. My God in his steadfast love will meet me. My God will let me look in triumph on my enemies. Do not kill them or my people may forget. Make them totter by your power and bring them down, O Lord, our shield. For the sin of their mouths, the words of their lips, let them be trapped in their pride. For the cursing and lies that they utter, consume them in wrath. Consume them until they are no more. Then it will be known to the ends of the earth that God rules over Jacob. Selah. Notice the image of dogs. This will repeat in the last section as well. Dogs were considered unclean animals by the Jews, so it's like David is calling the servants of Saul dogs, similar to what we might call goons of a mob boss, uh, bidding the, the, the desires of the mob boss. So David continues his imploring of God to protect him from these evil servants of an enemy who is clearly affected by demons. The final section is verses 14 through 17, and it continues. Each evening they come back howling like dogs and prowling about the city. They roam about for food and growl if they do not get their fill. But I will sing of your might. I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning. For you have been a fortress for me and a refuge in the day of my distress. O my strength, I will sing praises to you, for you, O God, are my fortress." the God who shows me steadfast love. Here, David contrasts the howling dogs who were prowling about the city in search of him with singing God's praises. He helps us to see what a faithful response is to the onslaught of his enemies against him, and that is to turn to God in worship, singing praise. Even when he was feeling oppressed and pursued, David proclaims that God shows him steadfast or loyal love. So how do we view imprecatory psalms? We've already noted that there are 10 imprecatory psalms in our Bible. Some Christians tend to pass by these psalms because they speak of vengeance and expressed hatred, characteristics that seem anathema to our Christian faith. But if we're honest, and we should be honest, We have to admit that these feelings are not strangers to our hearts. Even though we follow Jesus, our hearts sometimes cry out to God in exasperation because of those we perceive as enemies, those who are working against the uh, principles of God. So how do we deal with these imprecatory psalms from a faithful perspective? Julie Tennant is the writer of our metrical psalms, which we're using in our worship and every day in our daily devotions, She wrote about dealing with imprecatory psalms from a faith perspective, and she noted that there are four ways or lenses through which we can approach the enemies in these psalms. The first one is by spiritual warfare. Paul notes in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, for our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We can view the enemies in these psalms as the spiritual enemies of our souls, the demons, even Satan himself, 
who seek only to steal, steal, kill, and destroy us, as it says in John 10.10. Those who are serious followers of Jesus know what I'm talking about. The enemies of our souls are constantly trying to to derail us from following Jesus and from inviting others to follow Jesus. Those enemies are like a pack of dogs or wolves seeking to tear us apart and constantly attacking, sometimes in whispers, like, does God really love you? As Julie Tennant writes, evil has many expressions, but there is no doubt that behind those tangible agents is the evil one who is at work in this world, and it is right to pray for his demise with all of the robust imprecations that the Psalms can muster. So that's the first lens through which we can view these enemies that imprecatory Psalms uh, talk about. The second lens is vengeance transferred. Paul, quoting Deuteronomy 32, 35, points out in Romans 12, 19, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is my, mine, I will repay, says the Lord. The second lens through which we can view the imprecatory Psalms allows us to transfer our desires for vengeance to the Lord himself, who rightly reserves the right of vengeance. After all, the Psalms are prayers, and prayer in itself is an action, though not a physical one, per se. When we pray with the psalmists, we are asking God to enact vengeance in the case of imprecatory psalms, and we aren't taking vengeance ourselves. Take David as an example. He was, uh, he was pursued by Saul, and he had several points. He could have killed Saul, uh, but he didn't. He held his hand back, and he allowed for the vengeance of God to take place, rather than him in- enacting that, inve- that vengeance himself. So our anger at our enemies is expressed, but the right of vengeance is transferred to the only one who can righteously enact vengeance. So that's lens number two. Number three is the curse absorbed. Paul again writes in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. This lens through which we can view these psalms reminds us, importantly, that Christ has taken all of our curses upon himself on the cross. Every sin was nailed with him to the cross. Our enemies' sins, our friends' sins, even our own sins. And if we remember this, even as we pronounce curses or imprecations on our enemies, we'll see the mercy of God and find it, perhaps, possible to forgive. It certainly couldn't hurt to try that. The fourth and final lens is called the final end. This fourth lens through which we can view the imprecatory Psalms draws from the book of Revelation, chapter 11, verse 15, where it says, Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. We can recall that Christ, though he has taken the curse for all who trust in him, the judgment of God will still come upon all those who do not take refuge in Christ. Our great hope is that finally all evil will be vanquished and all suffering as a result will likewise vanish away. The victory of our God will one day be complete and thorough and we will live in a new creation where there will no longer be any evil, no death, no disease, no injustices, and Christ will reign in perpetuity. Through this lens, these imprecatory psalms, along with the various imprecations found throughout the psalms and other books of the Bible, serve as reminders, as beacons of hope in our God, who has triumphed over sin and death and will bring both to a final end. So Psalm 59 expresses a familiar feeling for those of us who follow Jesus. We can get angry at those who oppose and oppress us, We can get angry at those who work against the purposes of God in the world. But this psalm teaches us that we can be angry and still not sin, Ephesians 5, 26. And in the end, the proper way to process our anger is to turn it over to God in worship, 
to lift up our hearts to him and to leave our anger at his feet. Next week, we'll continue this series in the soundtrack of Lent with the third installment called Answer! Exclamation point. We're going to be looking at Psalm 4 in that case, and I invite you to, uh, to, to look at Psalm 4 in preparation for next Sunday. But right now, let's pause for a few moments to prayerfully reflect upon what God may be speaking to our hearts today.